this um, core concepts lectures is is really rather different from the services like things that you would get at Unity or Science of Mind or Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, this is more like a classroom, and um, uh, we're bringing in speakers of, of disciplines uh, that you're probably not going to find. You may not even find it in some universities. So uh, last week we had Shiva Miyuchi, and certainly it was a very interesting. Wasn't it for those of you who were, were here? It's very unlike. I don't know what classroom you'd go to to get that. Actually, that's a very different uh, approach. And uh, the first week of the lecture, we had uh, Keith Blanchard, and he was really talking about one of the universal principles: the law of righteous self-interest, a primary purpose, doing what you love. And it was a very, a very good um, uh, lecture at that. Next week, we have people coming from Colorado and from Huntsville, Alabama to uh, talk about Teutonic theology, something we don't hear much about. This is Nordic uh, theology. So that's the kind of thing that we hope to be bringing to people here at the uh, Core Concepts. Today, I'm having to fill the shoes of Norma de Jesus. And Norma de Jesus is on her way to Puerto Rico relative in the family bad deal and she apologized profusely and we will book her in again so that uh, you can hear from her. She has spent uh, some time with South American shaman and talking about 2012 and so forth and I asked her to come tell us uh, about their, their perspective. Everything is about perspective. I can tell you that Memphis is a terrible place to live but that would be one kind of perspective. There's a lot of people with that perspective. And then I could tell you that it's a great place to live, that it has so many unique qualities, and that'd be another perspective. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is my perspective, all right? And um, you have to take it as that. It is my perspective. Right? There, some years ago, the film, The Secret, was produced. And I don't want to do, say anything to denigrate that because it caused uh, a lot of study and a lot of activity in, in that area. Uh, when I first saw the movie, I thought, oh my goodness, this is awful. They, they are, you know, it's like taking a puzzle and you've got the lotto, somebody that knows how to look into the future. And it's got the lotto winner number on it. And you've got, this puzzle is in 13 pieces. And then you give somebody one piece and then expect them to have the number and to benefit by it to go buy the lotto ticket, right? Because uh, the law of attraction is one piece. And to the degree that, that they bleed into in their teaching now, for instance, when they went on the Oprah show, those people who had been in that film went on the Oprah show and people started asking questions. Then Beckwith and others will say, well, that was the law of abundance, or that was the law of pure potentiality. They talked about other laws there. So it was, I thought that was kind of, that's kind of interesting. And now you have people who are picking up on, on the law of, contra, uh, of attraction concept and are expanding on that. And, and to the degree that they move in and cover and talk about the others is to the benefit, is, is how much benefit you can get out of it because it's literally one thirteenth. Uh, Lao Tzu, the, the writer of the Tao Te Ching, and a very famous comment, I believe it's in his Sutra 81, where he says, the world is full of half-enlightened masters. Of what? Half-enlightened yeah. masters. <laughs> uh, you certainly don't want one thirteenth enlightened masters. Right? You want the whole picture. And, and so, in writing the laws of material wealth, the real objective there was uh, to make sure that the whole picture is there. And um, to see how they are connected is really a wonderful thing. I've written an article, it's, it's, you can get it on easingarticles.com or selfgrowth.com or if you can't find it out there on the internet, the easings, I'll be happy to 
send you a copy of it. It's called How the 13 Universal Principles of Success Are Connected. And you, I, can't, I couldn't show how each one of the 13 was connected to the other 12 because that would get into something like 369 explanations, right? Uh, but I did do one because everybody's familiar with the Law of Attraction. I did one showing the connection of the Law of Attraction to the Law of Being, to the Law of Unity, to the Law of Proper Perspective, uh, to the Law of, of uh, Relativity. Each one of the 13 uh, principles is in there showing you that, that connection. So that's, uh, uh, that's an important uh, part of it. Why does anybody want to study the Law of Attraction? You know, where it's... There's some reason for it. I mean, what, why are we even interested in the law of attraction? Now, normally in these lectures, for the benefit of our speakers, I have the a question and answer period at the end. And for the benefit of my lectures, I prefer that you just talk. You've got a question, you just ask. All right? You don't even have to hold up your hand. <laughs> and, we'll, and we'll have a discussion about it because I prefer that, that uh, uh, style of... Uh, teaching. But why do we, why do, why is, would anybody be interested in going to a class on the law of attraction? Because it affects them. Something you want? Yeah. Yeah, well, what you think is what you attract. And so understanding that and understanding just the depth of the law of attraction and what you can attract into your life and how you can attract it would be a real useful thing to know. And if you knew what the law of giving and receiving was about, and you knew what the law of pure potentiality was about, and you knew what the law of abundance was about, it would make the law of attraction, because each one is connected to each other, it would make it much more fulfilling. Now, now in the in the movie, they had some fellow there who wanted to date three women at the same time. Now this guy's a real fool, but nevertheless, I mean, he doesn't even know what he's asking for there. All right? <laughs> Does he, Clyde? No. <laughs> all right. But uh, then you had some fellow who wanted to have two million uh, dollar house. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with these things. These are physical manifestations, and it helps us to start out with smaller things, see them manifested, and then we go in, in into uh, bigger things. There is a core meaning for the law of attraction. The core meaning is that the inner being is drawing to itself the experiences it requires in its process of evolution and unfoldment. Right. That's kind of a heart, core definition of, of that principle. But when we understand all of them together, it makes a big difference. The real reason why this has, has had such a, an influence is because we are all creating something. We're all creators. Right? And we're all trying to do something, build something, a career, a business, an organization, something, right? A better life for ourselves, whatever the reason. And so we are, we are the continuing process of that, of that creation. But in order to do it, um, we have to recognize that even though there's hundreds of books, if I, if I brought all the books on success, on the, on the, the secret to success, some, some kind of book on the secret to success, it would, it would, it would cover all of this room. All right? And just a lots and lots of books, how to be successful, stockbroker, how to be a successful in real estate, how to be a successful speaker, whatever, you know, there's books on, on, on that. But we, we, we really, like everything else, need to go back to basics. Now, there's a famous and legendary coach of the Green Bay Packers, Vince Lombardi, after a really bad first half, went back to the locker room with the players and he picked up a football. And he said, gentlemen, this is a football. And you can't get any more basic than that, can you? He, he knew to go back to the beginning. This is a football. Right? And I'll give you a, an idea here. Most of you are familiar with the Genesis story. Well, that's going back to the basics, isn't it? What is the first thing that God did in, this, in the biblical creation story? 
He didn't create man and stick him into the void in the middle of the deep, did he? No, it was light. It was light, absolutely. He turned on the light so he could see what he was doing. That was the first thing he did, all right? And there's other meanings to light. Yeah. But, but um, uh, there was light. And then he divided the waters above from the waters below and the elements. And then there was the vegetation. And after the vegetation, there was the animals. And after the animals, the man. There was a process, right? You still have a whole lot of people running around talking about the secret to success. Secret to success. I'm here to tell you, from my perspective, there ain't no secret. It's not a secret. It has never been a secret. For over 200 years, people have been coming to this country from all over the world. And some of them make money big successes and careers and some don't, right? But it's not because they knew a secret. Right? Now, some of them may have had a formula for a beer <laughs> or something <laughs> that they brought with them from the old country. But what I'm saying is this is a process, not a secret. Insurance figures show that 85% of the people by age 65 at retirement age will be dependent on charity, family, the government, somebody. Only 15%. 85%. 85 only 15% are what they refer to as being financially independent. People of means from their own savings, their own investments, and their own income. 85%. So, looking at it that way, you're only competing with 85, with 15% of the population, aren't you? And you really don't need to be competing with them. Right. What's the what's the process then? Is what we're we're looking at is the process. And in all of these books that I mentioned being put on in here on the secret to success, lay them out on the table. All right, they're all saying essentially the same thing. If you analyze it, if you break it down, they're all saying that you've got to know what you want, you have to design a plan to get what you want, and you have to have the desire to see the plan through. Some of the books like Think and Grow Rich, for instance, put a lot of emphasis on having the persistency and the consistency to see the plan through. All right? Some people think that if they could just find a plan, if they could just get some help and design some kind of program, that everything would be all right. I think the most difficult thing for a human being to do is to li literally is to know what you want. Very difficult. Because we determine what we want by deductive reasoning. We say, I don't want to go to prison. I don't want to be sick. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to uh, be poor. Be huh? Don't want to be poor. We know all these things, and then from that, we've got a little bitty window of what we do want. All right? We begin to get a little picture there. And, for instance, they just had a class in here tonight on doing a vision board. We don't spend any time really thinking about what we want. Most of us don't. Right? And this, is a, this makes knowing what you want almost impossible. How do you know what you want? If you don't know who you are, if we don't know who we are, who we really are, what we are. So this was really the underlying reason for writing the Laws of Material Wealth, which I put out here for you to take a look at. The Laws of Material Wealth is a personal development program. It has developed in the seven or so years since I originally wrote this first book. The DVDs have been done, the CDs have been done, and by the way, pick you up a free CD before you leave if you don't have one. All right. um, that's about 46 minutes explaining what's in this over two hours, or what's in the book. Right. The book was, was written while I was raising capital for new businesses. I was in the venture capital business at that point. And so I used as illustrations people that I work for in raising money. I changed the names to protect the guilty. <laughs> because they were their own worst enemy. The entrepreneur was his 
is generally their worst enemy. The two things that they had a problem with, and they thought everything was capital, but the other thing that was even more perilous for them was management, because uh, most of the time people went go into business wearing rose-colored glasses. It's something they want to do. They get an idea, and uh, they could be the best mechanic in Memphis, but. If they don't know how to bring in customers, they don't know how to take care of the customers, they don't know how to invoice the customers, they you know, provide the service, uh, order new products and whatever they have, it's not going to survive. So there's a lot to do in a business. So I wrote that book really for those people that I was working with there. But I had in mind all the time the fact that uh, sort of like a Trojan horse, you know, uh, you've heard the story of the Trojan horse. Right. A lot of people don't care what Jesus or Buddha had to say, but they're very interested in what Vince Lombardi, Lou Holtz, and Barry Bryant had to say. So I wrote the rules of the game. Right? And some people don't care about uh, reading a book if it's not got to do with money. All right. So even though this, I'm taking these 13 universal laws and explaining them as the 13 universal principles of success, they're really 13 universal spiritual principles, all right, they're aspects of God. And while it's not really possible to go out there somewhere and find out about God, it is possible to find out about God by looking within. And if one can know themselves, if they can identify and verify these 13 principles from their own life experiences, there is a knowing that comes uh, that's very different from anything else. All right. No amount of reading, no amount of books and study will give those answers. And it's not easy. It's not a lot of fun. People would much prefer to go to a conference somewhere and find out about this system or that system or something else because identifying and verifying the laws from your own life experiences is, is actually hard work. And it's boring. You know, people don't want to do it. But, but I can tell you that a few years ago, I got a Honda CRV. All right. Now, before I got that CRV, it was just another box on wheels. She's got one. She's got a Toyota. Mercedes Benz makes them. Volvo makes them. Chevrolet makes them. All right. They just, if you look, if you're, if you're not paying attention, you walk down the road, you'll see 15 or 20 of these. SUVs pass, all right? And I hadn't paid any attention to a, a Honda. It's just another one. But as soon as I got that Honda, every time I would drive up to a red light, there was one in front of me, one beside me, one coming from across the, the street on the other side. They weren't making more CRVs. I just became aware. If you can do go through this process of identifying and verifying the laws in your life experience, then everything that's happening, everything that's happening, you'll know what it is. You'll know where it's coming from. It's not a big mystery. You're not going to be walking down the street saying, woe is me, what's happening to me? You won't be sitting in a coffee shop wondering what to do next, befuddled and terrified by the mysteries of life. You will know what is happening. And then if you're in the coffee shop and you're... Uh, uh, looking at anything to do with the laws, what you're doing is looking at, at planning what you want to do next, not even worrying about what happened. All right. And I make that promise for those who, who, who study this particular personal development program, is that you will not be walking down the street wondering what hit you, number one. And number two, this is a, I promise you, this is a self-verifiable program. You may not even like the way I write, much less speak, all right? But this is something that you can identify and verify for yourself. You don't need a guru. You don't have to contemplate your navel on a, in a mountain in Tibet. You don't have to do anything but sit down and work on this yourself in your own meditation periods. I suggest to, to students that if you meditate three times a day, and I know People's eyes roll back up in their heads because they know they're not meditating once, much less three times a day. But if you, if you at night are doing what they were doing today with your visualization board and your 
you're picturing and you're visualizing and you're seeing yourself doing what it is, is that you want to do and experiencing what you want to experience and having what you want to have. Then watch the results of that as you and you go to sleep and the inner consciousness is talking to you five times a night. There are five REM states. All right. So then when you get up and after, I'll let you go to the bathroom first, but then you get up and you sit back down on the bed and do what I call contemplative meditation. That is, just sit there and think about any vestige of that. You'll be amazed at how they begin to come back in the dreams and you can write them down and this is part of the process and then the third process of meditation is something that you do more akin to what most people are doing with their mattress and so forth sometime in the middle of the day and that's 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 my suggestion uh, uh, for the process there are a lot of things that you, you, you can't imagine until you're going into that process and until you're in, in there identifying and verifying that principle for yourself. Right. The third thing that I can promise you is that you won't go and listen to somebody like me speak or go hear a preacher or go to a seminar or workshop or read a book, listen to a tape that you don't know where they're coming from. It won't take you five minutes, eight minutes, ten minutes into a lecture to know whether that individual is speaking from the experiential or whether they're talking from academia, doctrine and dogma, or just blowing smoke. Right. You'll know, the, you will know immediately when something they say jars, jars you with that teeny sound of the unverifiable. You know? Now, that's three promises for this particular personal development program. Right? And I don't mean for this to simply be a uh, commercial for that program. We are doing some, uh, a lot of things with it. We're talking to a lot of people. We're doing CDs, DVDs, infomercials, and all types of things with it and have a special promotion coming up. But this is very different from any of the rest of my books. Unity Principles book is focused on what the founders and Emily Cady had to say about each one of the laws. The Mysteries Revealed is about the book of Revelation, which is not about the end of time, but it's about the process of moving from fear-based feeling to love-based living. It is a roadmap, regardless of what anybody may say about it. And I know a lot of derogatory things have been said about it. In fact, for 30 years I thought it the guy had to be sick in prison and on drugs to come up with such a thing. <laughs> but once you know the, uh, the symbols and the numbers and you apply it, it just falls right into place. It, 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 I didn't have to play with it or anything. In fact, I wrote the 22 chapter metaphysical interpretation in about eight hours in a C&K coffee shop on Austin P. Road. All right? Now, it took me a lot longer to write the three chapters in the front and the three chapters behind, but the actual interpretation of the 22 chapters of Revelation were written there. And an interesting aside from that, I hadn't saved it. I hadn't done anything with it. I just sat there. I mean, it just downloaded. All right? And I had to go make some copies and do some things, and at that point in time, there was an office depot across the street. I don't know if you remember that, but there was an office depot across from that C&K coffee shop on Austin P. And I went over there to make cof uh, copies. I came back by and there were cop cars everywhere. Armed robbers had come in from the right side and from the front during that little period that I was making copies. <laughs> and I didn't have any of it to take in my computer. So I feel like that this, this book has been blessed from the beginning. All right? And then the house that Nemo built is... is, is uh, it's a story in an allegory form that the um, Searcher's Roadmap is a book of 63 poems and the Father Confusion. All of these are very different. The Laws of Material Wealth is the only one that I think is so focused that you can look at it in relation to the experiences that you've had in business or in your job, all right, because you can see it, all right, and, 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 and um, 
and we have developed programs that go with it so you can actually experience it as well. The, the book is, is using illustrations from my work experience there. The DVD it follows the PowerPoint presentation and there's four of those. The workbook is very different. It has the same format, but it has five exercises per chapter to assist the reader in this process of identifying and verifying the laws. It has no other purpose. And if it does that, it has done something that, that is so extraordinary and will be so different for you that it's virtually like a paradigm shift in your life. Right? I expected more questions, but I guess I was so spellbounding that nobody had any, they didn't want to interrupt me. Um, do we have any questions about this? I'm surprised you haven't been on the speakers list at several places around town, like Unity. Did you talk out there? Yeah. You talked out there? Yeah, in both Unities, I've done uh, seven-week courses oh. on these. Yeah, well, I've and, been uh, many years. I was yeah, on the we West Coast. Just, we just did one this year at First Unity, and before that I've done one or two at... Uh, um, now, a lot of the stuff was not created during that period of time, but the, the, we, we did them there. And uh, my wife, uh, a little over a year ago, fell and broke her shoulder badly enough that they've had to replace it. And she's recuperating, and I, if I go out on an appointment, I generally go on one appointment, come right back, check her out, and I go back out on another appointment, I come back, check, instead of, instead of staying out. And that's, uh, we, she's doing real well back on it, and, um, and hopefully sometime in the early part of next year, we can get back on, get on to a speaking circuit. The plan, that's the plan. But I haven't been able to, I, 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 I've made a few trips like to St. Louis, uh, Nashville, and so forth, but um, it's, not, it's not very easy for me uh, to travel like that right now. So most of the stuff has, uh, is being, most of the exposure is going out through our five radio shows. This show, Corporate uh, Core Concepts, uh, is going to be lagging about one to two weeks behind and the shows that were, that, I mean when we film them here then they'll be on the, our television on YouTube and on the uh, TVU, our television, internet television station and the blog talk a radio show on Sunday night will, will be the soundtrack from this. So. Uh, we're, we're utilizing all of that sort of thing to get the information out where I can't physically travel so, uh, so easily yet. Yeah, yeah. Is the blog talk the same Sunday night? Like, is this one on tonight? No. Or is it it's always going to be running two, behind one or two a weeks. A week or two. Okay. And it's not call-in. The rest of our shows, the other five shows, are all call-in. You can call in and talk live. They're all archived. But you can call in and ask questions to those shows you you'll not be able to do that one for the core concept show. And, um, and the TV, same thing. We're, the idea for the TV is that it will, we will have advertising on our station. We have our own station and we'll have advertising and music and all the rest on there. Hopefully we'll have your CD on there, that sort of thing. And then we'll have advertising on there and then it'll have a, a button you can click on and then you can go and watch that show, like you pay for view. All right, is is the way we are envisioning it at present. That may change, you know, because we're we're just getting into that, and it's a lot of technical stuff. And anybody in the family can tell you I'm the most untechnical person that's ever come down the pike. I don't even use a screwdriver well. <laughs> so we get toys for the kids. My wife puts them together. There's electrical problems in the house. My wife does that too. It's a different type of technical because you can write a contract that's technical. But I can write a technical. I can write a contract, but you know they asked me to do a um, what they call a storyboard for the house that Namu built. Now Namu is human spelled backwards, and he lives in the Valley of Nam, the Valley of Man, in other words, and. Uh, he has a vision that he's to build a house for God, and then he has to deal with this. His big problem is a priest named Rafe, which is fear spelled backwards. And Rafe is 
wife is Regna, which is anger spelled backwards. And, and he goes into the mountains to find the sage Rini Nam, which is inner man spelled backwards. Making you use your left brain, right brain at the same time. All right? And, and it, it is a, an allegory. It's like a modern day parable. And in it, he discovers, he recognizes each one of these 13 principles. All right? That's, that was the objective of it. They asked for a storyboard. I wrote what I thought was a storyboard. I broke it down. I told them I was going to do this, do that. And they politely sent me a letter and said, that's not a storyboard. So I realized right away I have to get a technical writer. <laughs> I have to get somebody that knows what a storyboard is. It's not writing at all. It's picture no, Yeah, it's drawings. Isn't it? yeah, it's but that's for films. It depends on what. Well, we are, we're, we, we have a film company else. in New York that's yeah. talking about doing an animated feature film of this book. And we'd also like to do a, uh, uh, like a comic book for children. We, we, we talked about doing a children's version, but now that's kind of gravitated toward creating a comic book character story book of, of, uh, of that one. And we've been working for three years on the film The River of Light, which is another book. We're, we've got it all the soundtrack and everything is already there, but we uh, uh, we need some uh, public domain. We need some shots of rivers from the air. We need to be able to, some clouds from above, different things like that. That we and, and I'd like to shoot some on a smaller river like the Wolf River, and then then that will go to editors. Yeah. So we've got a lot of we've got a lot of projects on. And if you are interested in it, you just ask and I'll send you what's called the Renford Profile, which is more of a profile on what we're doing than a profile on me. There's a little profile on there, but that's the same that's in the back of all the books. But this is a profile of all the projects. If you're if you're interested in that sort of thing, I'll just I'll send that copy. Any other questions, criticisms? Anything from the girls back there? Yeah, we got a question, darling. When we gonna leave? When we gonna leave? Now, <laughs> after you listen, if you want to listen to Soriana, Soriana may play again for us one song. Right? All right. Thank you very much for being with us. And don't forget to get your CD if you don't have one. You get your own copy. Trust your heart and let it sing the
you could you could probably uh, pick up some of that if you wanted to. Anything else, anybody? Okay. Thank you.